We're going to talk about CS for All looking forward. So there's been a lot of conversation earlier about some new commitments and projects. There's been a lot of conversation about kind of what needs to happen in the short near term to make some changes. So this conversation is going to be about how we, what is the long road here? So this is a marathon, not a, not a sprint, right? This is, where there's a lot of excitement. Things are rolling. We had an announcement from the president. I mean, the sea change of what has happened for computer science education in just the short time that of the last span of the last three years has been enormous. So this is about how do we keep the momentum going <laughs> and where do we see ourselves in five years and what are really the big obstacles to get there. So we're going to talk um, amongst the panelists for just a few minutes and then we're going to open it up for contributions from everyone in the room. So. Um, Sitting to my left is Jan Cuny, who you all presumably know, and um, she is with the National Science Foundation and has been focused for a very long time on broadening participation in computing and is um, really responsible for the cs for all initiative at the large part. Um, Alice Steinglass, is that right? Yes. From Code.org, who is um, working on initiatives on their end and marketing and you can our, tell the rest. Yeah, yes. I run our marketing, product, and engineering teams. Okay. So. And then um, Mark took the Mark Nelson took the helm of CSTA about a year ago this uh, week. Ten months ago. This week. Ten months ago. This wow. Ten months ago, and CSTA is the Computer Science Teachers Association, and um, we are happy to have leadership at the helm of that organization. So um, I'm going to start with Jan. So I'm sure everyone in the room knows that NSF has some funds set aside. So what do you hope to achieve with those funds? What is the big goal? OK, so I would like to, um, first of all, it's $120 million. It sounds like a lot of money, but um, it's not actually all that much money when you start figuring out you know, overhead and all the other things that come out of that money. At any rate, uh, we're, we're planning to spend that $120 million. $120 million is new to CS for All, but it's not new to NSF. That means that it came out of other places, and not all of those people are happy about that. So, uh, so there's a lot of uh, contention for this money, um, but I think we've come up with some pretty good plans. Unfortunately, we're not allowed to talk about plans because that would give you all an advantage if you could start thinking early about your proposals. So I can't talk about that, but I can talk about the kinds of things that I would hope to see in five years from now or 10 years from now after this money has all been spent. Um, I think I would like to see a lot more research. Uh, we are, um, I've kind of stopped trying to convince states and districts and schools to teach computer science because we have so much of it going on right now that all of the providers of PD and, and these things are really stretched already to their limits. Plus, we haven't really uh, ever done the research as a community. I mean, there was a panel I was sitting in on earlier where they mentioned that there were four uh, tenured educational researchers in computer science in the country, right? We just have not done the research that we need to do. And, and many of the education researchers in the country are not doing computer science in part because we haven't paid any attention to them or asked them to work with us, but in part because they've just gone on and done other things. This is an amazing opportunity. We are doing something that is really unprecedented, scaling on a completely new subject at the rate that this is being scaled in so many places at once, and scaling it from K to 12 all at once. Uh, this is really unprecedented, but what an opportunity for education researchers. It's this wide open field where you know, everything is low hanging fruit that they could work on. So my hope is that in five to 10 years, we actually don't say we don't have any research. That we say we have lots of data that says how we should be teaching computer science, how we should be training teachers to teach computer science, that we're no longer doing this by what we think is going to work, right? We get smart people in the room and say, what do you think we should do? And then we do that. But you know, studying it and actually having data. So I think it's an amazing opportunity to get researchers involved because researchers in education always complain about how they do their research and nobody ever adopts what they do. So we know a lot of things about how to teach, but not very many people are using those state-of-the-art things. But here, we have a whole body of teachers who are 
really looking for help, right? They're just starting out teaching. It's the teachable moment. So I think what we should do is do a ton of implementation with research running right alongside of it. And then the impact of that research is immediately felt. So it's not we're going to publish a paper and put it on a shelf. It's like we are going to now give this to all the other projects which are connected in 10 years or five years across the country so that when I work with um, someone and they say, oh, I've got this great idea and here's my data that it works, I hand it to Dan or to Brian. I have got everything, you know, all of this stuff is all networked together. So I think we as a community have to take a deep breath as we rush into this, think about what the research agenda should be. We have no learning progressions, right? If you go to a math ed person and you say, what should a fourth grader know about recursion? They know, right? We don't, it's we don't know. what they know. What? It's pathetic what they say they know. Well, but they know something. <laughs> It's not as good as nothing. It's better than nothing, and we know nothing. And so we really have to work on uh, the research that supports it. How do we best train teachers? We have a lot of different models on how professional development happens right now. Is it good to have how much should be online? How much should be face-to-face? -face? Do we need to train them more on pedagogy and less on content? Do they need more content? How do you support them once you get them? What kind of learning communities can you establish that are virtual that will actually be meaningful for them? There's a whole bunch of really significant research questions. So my hope is that in five and 10 years, almost every school is running great computer science and that we have data that tells us how to, that's continuing to refine how we're approaching this, both in terms of training teachers and in what we present to the students. So we have um, CSTA and Code.org here, and as most of you know, Code.org does a lot of um, teacher PD, but they also do a lot of marketing and awareness raising and um, advocacy work. So what do you think is, is the five year, maybe eight year, what's your, what, what, what puts Code.org out of business? What, what, what allows you to close the doors? Uh, well, I think there's two big things we're pushing for. Um, and the first is having that local support in every area. And when we started out, we were training teachers. We, you know, the, so there aren't a lot of teachers who know how to teach computer science, as we all know. There also weren't a lot of people who know how to teach teachers how to teach computer science. And so um, we were flying our facilitators into each region at the high school level um, from out of town to come in and do this training here. And then they're in North Carolina, and then they're in Texas. And, um, and we really want to build that support locally. So we've, we've transformed our professional development model, now call it professional learning, and we're partnering with STEM centers and universities in different regions. We have 20 partnerships so far. Um, but our goal is really to allow the, the groups that today do math you know, professional learning or science professional learning to give them all the tools they need to work with their community to, to support the schools that are there with professional learning. And if we can build that model around the country and give everybody the support to do it themselves and to be there with the teachers, we think that's a lot more powerful and that's, what we're, that's really where we're trying to go. I think the thing that needs to be there to support that is also the government support for that. And when we talk about five or 10 year plans or sustainability models, it's critical that funding um, is a part of that. Um, one of the things that somebody said, like, can we have calls to action here? I've got one call to action that I, I want to put out there. Um, Vandana mentioned it earlier, but there's a petition right now um, on change.org, which is about getting Congress as part of this budgeting proposed process they're going through right now to support computer science um, funding. And that's critical. It's critical to our long-term plan. And if you haven't signed the petition, I'd ask that you guys sign it. But even more important, if you can reach out to your communities to try to rally support around that. Because if we can make, if we can get funding at the congressional level to support computer science education, that can then also make it sustainable at all of these local levels to be able to actually give the teachers the training. Because I think you mentioned earlier, it's expensive. Um, training teachers is expensive and something that we really want to make sustainable. So I think in terms of long term, you know, make, getting it local and um, hopefully having government behind it is important. Okay, so in terms of sustainability for teachers at the local level, <laughs> um, it seems to me that CSTA is the natural home. So what are you going to do with this horde of teachers headed your way? <laughs> and um, <laughs> how, is, how is CSTA hoping to uh, rise to this challenge? Um, 
you know, that's, a, that, that's an interesting one. You know, I think the way I, I often explain kind of CSGA, I think for a lot of people, is uh, we're entering our teen years both literally and figuratively. You know, so CSGA is just a little over 10 years old. Um, and, and like many associations or many organizations of this age, it's, it's that process of, you know, of figuring out our identity, who we want to be when we grow up, moving to more mature practices. Um, and, and, you know, for, for a profession, you know, association plays a critical role in terms of, of crea uh, credibility for that profession. And, and there's a lot of pieces which kind of have to be in place. And as, you know, as we were talking earlier, um, you know, there, there are key things which need to kind of be put in place that, that aren't quite there yet. So as we talk about standards, you know, so we have, certainly we, we, we've done a lot of work around standards. Uh, there's still a lot more to be done, I think. Uh, if you look at the standards now, they're mostly focused on content standards, but we also need pedagogy standards and we need assessment standards. Um, and, and, and that requires research. And so, you know, we have to think about the research infrastructure that's ultimately there and, and, and supports those pieces. A second big piece, I think, which is, is kind of out there, um, is data. I mean, it's m most of my doctor work was in data analytics. Um, uh, you know, and I, I get really anxious about how little data <laughs> there is to, to really kind of make informed decisions off of. Um, you know, and, and, and so I think that's a big piece. Uh, you know, as an association, uh, a big part of what we're working on currently, and, and which we'll, you know, you're going to start seeing, I think, more and more of these effects are uh, just moving to more mature association practices. You know, as we start to grow up as teenagers, we're, we're implementing practices which will help us, you know, do better volunteer management, better chapter management, give tools, chapters those tools they need to, to actually be able to engage their local teacher communities. Um, you know, and then I think the last big piece is uh, professional development. And, and you know, if I pick our one biggest area uh, of need and our biggest projects which I see coming forward, it, it's around PD. And, and so we have a, a big project oriented, uh, we're calling it the continuing, Continuous Professional Development P CPD Pipeline. And it's this whole idea of, um, you know, we're not going to, CSTA is not in a position to compete against the other PD providers, and I don't think that's what we ought to do. It, I think that the, really the role for CSDA is more one of uh, looking at, you know, the teachers have, I, th I think, kind of this challenge of, of confidence and competence lots of times. And so how do we provide a support structure so if they're teaching something or they're teaching something new that they know that they have something to fall back on if there's a question they can't answer? So what's that support network ultimately look like? But it's also... Um, you know, we look at uh, being able to do a developmental pre-assessment to help teachers figure out this is where I'm weak, this is where I'm strong, this is where I most need PD. And then being able to say, well, here's the PD which I could most use. Or help, one of the challenges we've heard from a number of teachers is, um, you know, they know they need PD, but they can't figure out between all the PD providers. So how do I figure out who's offering what and how, is, is that the right PD for me based on my background or my experience or my student population? Um, and so trying to be able to help with those pieces. Um, and then that, that CPD concept is really one of building that into digital badging and a digital portfolio so we can help teachers track what they're doing for PD over time, ultimately then link that to data to be able to show, all right, teachers have gone through PD in this kind of path or this kind of orientation. It has this ultimate result on their, on their outcomes or the student outcomes um, that they're teaching and, and you know, those pieces ultimately begin to, to link together. And so we can maybe, maybe I'll say, well, if you're a teacher who, who's been teaching music for years, um, and now you're teaching computer science. We found that teachers who come from that background, they tend to do better if they learn these concepts before those concepts. And so that's kind of the idea that these pieces ultimately fit together into this larger framework to really help the teachers be more effective and, and, and help them with almost like personalized roadmaps as to, to how they pursue PD. Well, I, I really think that they need community. And the, you know, they need, mm -hmm. like anyone else, Asking the person next to you how they did it is easier than all the web d repositories in the world. Right. Like well, the navigation piece is really critical. Yeah, and, and that's I mean that's part of becoming a, a more mature association. So one of the big pieces which goes live for us probably in June will be um, more of the community management tools begin to go into place. And so if we think that the PD pipeline, if a teacher goes through a certain PD program, we can help link those teachers who've gone through that PD program and help make sure that they're successful or be able to connect them to other people who've been in that space. Or if there's, you know, one of the things we're looking at is when uh, new PD is coming up within a, a region or an area, being able to show that through the chapter link so that the teacher can see, uh, this is the PD that's coming up for me. Or here are the other teachers who've gone through this PD in my chapter so that they can then talk to other teachers. So, so yes, how we then better enable engagement and community and volunteering is all a big part of that. 
Okay, so I'm going to throw a tough one at all of you, which I didn't really warn you about, but this is also for all of you. <laughs> so you'll have a little minute to think about it. Um, what is the linchpin? Like, this is a big, hairy, audacious goal, right? This is a huge undertaking that we're all taking, and there's a big matrix national community. Like, if there was one lever that, given all the resources in the world, that you could just pull to make a big difference, what is that lever and what kind of difference might it make? Who wants to go first? I think I already answered. <laughs> so Which is, you're so saying she's volunteer, go first. It's part of federal education funding. I, there's a lot, that's not an answer in and of itself, right? right? Like there is no way that if the money got turned on tomorrow, we're ready to, to spend that correctly around the country. Um, but in terms of a long-term difference that we could make, um, and that's why, you know, given that Congress is right now doing their budgeting, this is, the, this is the time to push. But that is, I think, if you were to pick one thing that would make a big difference, having funding behind it would support all of these other initiatives. Um, I think from our perspective, the piece that we're working on that, you know, assuming the money comes, I think somebody said when, not if. So when, yeah. when that money comes, um, I think the piece that we're really trying to support is that there is then training for teachers, and in particular, really focus on teachers who don't know computer science, because almost none of them do. Um, and trying to build this integrated program that is about a professional learning program that matches a curriculum and a set of tools that work together to make it easy to pick it up. Um, you know, for example, not just throwing someone in front of an IDE that's got you know a million, you know, a Python IDE with everything turned on, but letting you know letting the student and teacher work together and see all the pieces as they come in, so that it's easier for a teacher with no experience to pick it up and use it. Uh, and that's really the piece that we're going to focus on. But if you're asking what the linchpin is. Uh, I think that you know that's the one I would call out as something that would make a huge difference. Forty-four thousand signatures. Forty-four thousand, and more after you guys help out. <laughs> Jan or Mark, who wants to take? It? So I think that there's a number of things. I would agree that sustainable funding into the future is really important. Um, another thing that I think would really be incredibly helpful is if we got to ed schools and started putting in pre-service courses for teachers not just for computer science teachers, that would be great, but for every teacher. So every teacher should know something about computer science. And if we could have that so that every teacher, K-12, had a background in computational thinking, uh, some familiarity with some sort of programming, then you could imagine going to a one-day training as a third grade teacher and really getting something out of it, building something on this confidence. I think that lots of teachers think that this is hard and scary and they don't know anything about it and I think that they go to their one day training and then if they have to that they do it to their kids but the attitude that they portray is this is hard this is complicated I don't like it and you know those subtle cues that kids get especially you know there's there's data that shows that second grade girls if they have taken math from a female math teacher who do, who's not comfortable with math they already in second grade believe that girls can't do math. You know, no one's told them that in second grade, but they've picked that up from this female teacher who seems uncomfortable. So w it would be great, you have to wonder why anyone would be uncomfortable with second grade math, which is, you know, addition and subtraction kind of stuff. But that comfort level is something that we have to really pay attention to. So I think if we could have courses that were exciting, fun courses, like we're offering in high school, but offer them to every teacher, replace the technology course because teachers actually know how to use technology by the time they get to college now. Um, replace that course with a really fun, interesting, exciting course so that when they were asked to teach it, it was something they were looking forward to. That would be great. Pre-service would have been mine, I think, as, as well. So if I, if I went one beyond that, then I think my next one would be um, clear. It seems to me there's a lot of difference within the community right now as to what actually is computer science. We're not all talking about the same thing. And, and then when we go and talk to, so when you talk to the other stakeholders, if you're talking to a superintendent or you're talking to parents, there's yet different, different, other differences. And, and it gets down to even, I think, things like, you know, should computer science be counted as math or not? Should computer science be counted as science or not? Should computer science replace, should computer science replace uh, modern language or not? Um, you know, and, and you know, as I've talked to a lot of people, it, it, there's very different, I mean, it seems almost 50-50 split in different things. And 
And when you talk to industry, they seem to mean one thing for computer science. And then I think as we go forward, you know, as cybersecurity and robotics and data analytics and you know, data science, you know, all these other fields begin to emerge, which are also connected to computer science, that question is only going to get more complicated. And so I think we have to figure out to some extent what do we mean when we're talking about computer science. Okay, so I do want to ask some questions, but I want to give you a caveat here, is that we had a conversation earlier today with a lot of these same kinds of, of um, issues, right? I mean, this is a topic we've been kind of talking about. And so um, lately I've been thinking about this idea of how do we move from the sort of hand-wringing deficit model that we're all kind of stuck in about there's not enough and there's not enough of this and there's not enough of that and there's a lot of hand-wringing, right? And how do we move then to an asset model where we're sort of envisioning the future that, um, that is possible and we're talking about it in that way. So like, it's tremendous how much progress has been made, but for those of us that have been in this conversation now for 12 years, really, um, this is all talked over. It's been talked over and talked over and talked over, but then there's all these new people moving into the conversation, right? And so like, how do we move from having that conversational churn, right, to getting us to that next level, and what's gonna like move us? Like move us big and put us where we need to be, you know, five years from now. And there's a lot of sort of fast, cheap, and ugly going on right now. We've got to just make it happen. Let's make it happen. But as we're doing that, there's a danger, and I think Jan would echo this, of leaving certain students behind, right? Fast, cheap, and ugly is exactly that, fast, cheap, and ugly. So how can we um, move our conversation but at this, and, and be about speed and scale, but also be about equity. So what are those types of strategies? And obviously we're not gonna solve this problem here, but like, as you're thinking about what you're gonna say, think about from that lens of what is the future, what is an asset model, and what is an inclusive model. All right, who's first? Dan Garcia. Yeah. I was All right, do say I have a mic thing. runner? Do I have a mic runner? Okay. Dan. You don't have a choice for that, I'm I'm mostly worried about this, and this I brought this up when we had our we had our January meeting in, in Maryland, um, and I'm really excited about the change.org conversation. So I'm I'm turning the wheel a little bit here, and what you charge me with. Um, I. I think that if we can get this to be a bipartisan issue, that we all get on board, then this is like the perfect world and the sunlight comes off in the rain. For, but there's, it's just so easy to label anything that's a spending initiative as a, as a left initiative and, a, and a tag it to this president. And I, I just, I worry about that. And I worry about, we need funding in this space. This, this could be so transformational. And if, if zero money comes out of that four billion proposed and zero comes out of it, we can still scramble, but it's boy, really gonna be a, a, an uphill battle. So I, I appreciate the change.org, and I appreciate all the, the folks on the, on the right who have signed up for that, and I appreciate all of us who can reach out to those folks to continue that, but I think that's, that's the biggest thing right now. And so I, think, I thank you for bringing that up on, on the stage, because that's, that's the one that I'm worried about. I want to figure out what other techniques, in addition to that, we can all do kind of, uh, we, our networks are big, but they're not that big. We, we need to get to way farther outside of that. So do we need to take out an article of this? And, uh, should we think outside the box in terms of messaging to get to people who say, wow, I, that's, yeah, me too, yes. That speaks to me who aren't CS people, who aren't in our small little nip. That's my, that's my. Yeah, there was something Al Gore said last night. He put up a, a statistic from the defense industry yeah. or from the defense you know, people that they had been warning about climate change steadily, regardless of the administration and nonpartisan. So maybe one of our our places to go is defense. Yeah. Oh. If we can get defense to care about this, it's kind of fireproof. Oh, defense does declare does care about this. So I've been working with um, Karen Saunders from the Department of Defense, and they uh, they have supported NIMSI in um, introducing. CS principals into 200 schools, and they have uh, we're in the they're in the process of support of partnering with NSF for additional funding. So I think the Department of Defense is um, is interested at least at some levels. 
Not at the four billion dollar level. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, since we have Kumar in the room from OSTP, um, can you give us your two cents, ten cents on on the road ahead and where you hope we're going to get? You probably need a mic. I think it's a great question. So, you know, a lot of the folks in this room represent, you know, Jan being a prime example, this idea that this has been a process. You know, it's been years in the making. Folks have been working on this for a long time. So, uh, I think it will remain a process. Um, I think the past, you know, you could take it in different chunks of time. So, the past couple of years, when you've seen legislative activity at the state level, I think has been has really uh, gotten a lot of people's attention. So we went from 11 states, and now we're 29 states that are allowing CS to count. I think that's, people have found that to be surprising. A lot of times, state activity does not happen that quickly in a short period of time. Um, I think just even since uh, the president sort of put down the marker in the State of the Union, uh, and we announced the initiative in January, you know, we are just three months in, since then. We've seen five governors, uh, take action in expanding CS in their states. We've seen, you know, major sort of continued bipartisan activity, a legislative coalition on the Hill, continued uh, action by partners and funders. So, and, you know, as Jen was saying, like an ongoing list of federal agencies that are seeing themselves connected to this work. And then this is anecdotal, so I can't sort of say, but like just a huge wave of response from the field that they feel like this gives them another validation point to go back to their school leader to say. So I think we are like super interested in one, the next 270 days and making sure that we are doing as much as possible to give momentum to the movement. Some of that is gonna be the legislative piece, some of that is gonna be uh, institutionalization within the agencies. Um, but then also thinking about, you know, uh, how does this have uh, real momentum on the ground? Um, and then making sure, you know, whether it's the new team, uh, but, uh, and what, whatever their relationship with this body of work is, but making sure that this continues to grow and expand. So uh, the analogy that we always sort of make to the overall budget proposal is, you know, early childhood, where early childhood remains a deeply bipartisan issue. The fact that there's a lot of bipartisan momentum uh, uh, on both sides of the aisle, and you know, now Congress has successive, in successive years, put funding against it that has continued to make progress on this. So I don't think folks should say, you know, if we're not at X by uh, in the next six months, you know, but, but it will require this kind of uh, putting, kind of putting momentum behind it. So we're like eager to get your ideas both in the immediate, and that's why I sort of, I sort of talked about the policy challenges too, because there might be, things that we can also do that are at the super practical level that could be, that could sort of unlock capital on the ground. So those are the ways we're trying to think about how to maximize both the immediate, but then also set up for future teams, you know, to be able to carry forward this work, so. Um, does everybody in the room know about the fact sheet and everything that went out in January? Do you know how you get in the fact sheet? Everyone know that? Well, if you're doing something or you're on the precipice of doing something that could be elevated by support from the White House um, and you have something that is measurable, new, and um, related to CS for All, you can talk to Kumar. And um, there, there's never any guarantees, but if there's an opportunity for the president to, or anyone in the administration, Megan or whomever, to elevate and, and assist, then sometimes in my case it's been a bit of a carrot for a funder to say, hey, there's this deadline. If we can get this into this fact sheet, you know, can you sign the dotted line on that check? And um, that really can be help, really helpful. But, so be thinking that about that as you're building, you're designing your um, initiatives if there's something that can help you. Um, is there anyone else that wants to uh, jump in? Shocking, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I would have thought. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually a little nervous about the success we've had um, because um, 
A lot of it feels to me to be sort of crisis driven. Like, you know, there aren't any jobs in manufacturing, the jobs are all in intellectual stuff and, uh, and it's all computing based and so we need a lot of computer programmers for work and so everybody had better support computer science education or else. Um, and what that leads to is stuff like, uh, I'm going to pick on the CSTA a little bit, the K-12 CS standards that, you know, says exactly what a kindergarten kid should learn about computer science and then exactly what different stuff a first grader should learn about computer science and, um, and so on. And I'm afraid um, that we are on a path to turning computer science into one of those school subjects that everybody hates. Um, you know, and Jen, you asked the question of how can, uh, how can math teachers be afraid of, I'm sorry, how can elementary school teachers be afraid of the level of math that's in second grade? Um, and I can answer that question for you. I'm not going to do it right now. But there's a long history of it, and it has to do with sort of over-curriculumizing things, I think. Um, and especially something like computing, that I'm kind of a one-track mind about this, it's so much fun. And, <laughs> it is. <laughs> and I'm really nervous about turning it into school because it's so jobs-driven instead of how is this uh, personally fulfilling for kids driven? Right, so I agree with you that this job drivenness makes me very nervous. Um, and job, jobs are something that sells big, right? That is a bipartisan issue. Everybody wants more jobs. It's something that parents understand. They want their kids to be able to get jobs when they finish with school. But really, computer science is something you need for life to become a, an educated 21st century participant, you need to know computer science. You know, my son did not want anything to do with computer science because I was doing it, and then right. that was not for him. And so he will tell you that he doesn't know anything about computer science, but he also taught courses in Logic Pro at the Apple Store, right? And that's kind of a, you know, but he didn't think of that as computer science. He thought of that as music because he's doing music. And I think that it's a part of life in the 21st century and all kids should have the opportunity to do it. Whether they're gonna do it for their job, which many of them are, surprisingly, it's kind of everywhere, or maybe not surprisingly, but also just for life. And because we as a society will be making huge decisions about the role of technology in our society, about security issues and privacy issues, we're gonna to have to make those decisions. And right now, many of the people who are making those decisions really don't know anything about computer science. And I, I realize that we're not all gonna be cybersecurity experts even in the future, but I think a, an educated citizenry has to have some understanding of the role of computation in our lives. So like maybe we need to uh, do a change.org to get some computer scientists elected to Congress. Yeah. <laughs> there's actually one, I think, in Congress. Yes, but there's one. Jerry, yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to add to what you were saying here. I think totally agreed with everything that you were just said. Um, but back to what you're saying about having assets. This is one of those places where we have an asset. Computer science, we're really lucky. It's one of those few subjects that doesn't, you know, we, we do a mix of online and offline, which I think is super important. We can talk more about that. But some of it's going to be on a computer. And the part that's on a computer means that we then get to get a lot of data about what's going on with those students. And so, for example, in our CS Fundamental courses, we have tens of thousands of students doing this all the time every day. And we measure the success based on not just are they learning concepts, but are they learning concepts, are we reaching our equity goals, um, and are they liking it? And that's important. Um, and I think it's, you know, we treat those, you know, we don't, it's not like, oh, learning first. It's actually we built, before we built our learning proficiency measures, we built our likability measure, um, a little heart that they can check at the end of every single puzzle. And we can see day by day what's happening with, you know, we changed this hint. Do students like it a little less? Um, and that's something you can do when you're teaching computer science that you can't do 
in some of these other fields. And so I think we can keep that focus on this is also, you know, we want to inspire creativity. We want to inspire building. We want to inspire the kids to see what they can do with this. Um, and we want to do it all in a way that reinforces equity um, and is bringing along, you know, if I see any disparity between, you know, we're getting less women are liking this less than males or dropping off sooner, then I can respond to that and be like, that's not working. We need to change how we're doing that because we need to make sure that we're continuing to drive equity with everything that we're doing. So, right. that's so we're, <laughs> we're getting close on time. So I want to take one question from the back right there and sure. then um, let the panelists have like a final thought. So I want to um, continue on what Jan was saying earlier about um, the, the digital citizenry and, and needing to know computer science for everybody. But I think we're, we as a community are at fault for, uh, for not saying that loud enough, right? I mean, you know, there is this strong um, link between jobs and, and what we're teaching in schools. Um, and that's a, that's a good link to make because yes, I mean, if you have computer science backgrounds, then you can get high paying jobs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think um, now that we're ready to move on beyond that, I think we as a community should be louder in, in making that point um, to, um, uh, to decision makers, to parents. I mean, and parents are a big thing and school decision makers are a big thing because if you, if you start inculcating the sense among fourth grade parents that if they learn this, they take this one class, then suddenly they're gonna get a CS job then I think we are losing the game. So, so you know, in the other room we were talking about what is, what does, um, you know, how, how can we define success in the context of diversity and inclusion? I think we need to explicitly uh, say that number of CS graduates or number of CS jobs is not a success metric necessarily for, uh, for seeing how inclusive and how diverse our population is going to be. So I think that we, I, you know, in terms of looking ahead, we need to start getting louder in terms of uh, defining that better. Yeah, let me just add to that is that I think it's not just K-12, right? We're going to get this wave of kids coming out of K-12 that's going to add to the wave of kids we already have showing up in the undergraduate programs. But this new wave is going to be different in that not all these kids want to be software engineers. They want to be physicists or journalists, or, and they are convinced that they need not the obligatory, yes, I checked the box and took a computer science course, but I took four or five because I really need to use this in what I want to do in my life. And so I think that all of these changes that we're talking about at K-12 are going to have an enormous repercussions at what departments can re should reasonably be doing at the college level as well. So one thing I wanted to add to that, um, last year at the NCWIT Summit, there was a session um, by Karen Ashcraft that you know, people were texting me like, this is blowing my mind in the middle of it. And one of the things she kind of broke down for us, because we had for a long time been like, there's this many jobs and women are the obvious group of people to fill those jobs. Well, the reverse of that is we need, if you say we need women or minorities in computing because there's all these jobs, then the opposite of that is if there weren't the jobs, we wouldn't need them. And the reality is we need the technical minds of everyone to create the technology and innovation of the future. And that's what I mean by like moving us to this asset conversation. And a lot of people have already gotten there, but as everyone's jumping into the conversation, we need to help them along and kind of leapfrog over that jobs conversation. And you know, there's a lot of other corollaries to that and when you dig into the gender and inclusiveness piece. All right, so final thoughts, because I know we're trying to get us back on time. Um, so final thoughts, you wanna start, Mark? Sure, you know, I guess, um, you know, the one other thing that came up to my mind as, as people were talking is, um, you know, as, as we think towards the future and we think about what to do, th there are a lot of interesting models emerging in other countries and other parts of the world, and, and, and I haven't really heard that come up much in different conversations. Um, you know, I look at, you know, some of what's going on in the UK, I mean, one of the programs there, uh, Apps for Good, um, they're starting to look at, at doing some things within the U.S., and it's a, it's a great model in terms of making that social connection and, and particularly, uh, and, and some of what they've done in terms of creating the underlying teacher support is amazing. I mean, they've got a brilliant model there for doing that piece, and, and, and you know, we're working a little bit with them to see how do we, how do we bring that over into the U.S. Um, and another model is uh, New Tech Kids, which is in Holland. Um, they are doing some really, really fantastic stuff with kids uh, up to age 10, um, so kind of pre-K to 10. And uh, you know, they don't really introduce things like coding until about fourth, the fourth grade equivalent, but by the time they get to sixth grade, they can, they can actually do some systems dynamics type of stuff, I mean, which you know, most kids will probably will never see um, until they maybe they get to grad school. So 
Um, you know, I think there's some really good models out there, and people are doing some really great things, and, and, and we have to be a little bit more open to getting the international view and, and, and input into the process, which, which I, I don't know we've done as much as we could yet. Yeah, well, I think there's been a lot of great points today. I think one of the interesting comments that I'm hearing a bunch is, you know, how do we make how do we see computer science as less vocational and more foundational? And I think one of the one of the things that we all know a lot about is the the movement to, with you know uh, CS principles and the way we're rethinking how we teach computer science that really does make it a lot more foundational and a lot less you know vocational. Um, vocational in the sense that no matter what you do in life, you probably need this. But at the end of it, I'm not designing websites and you know just tweaking you know CSS. At the end of it, I've learned some really foundational concepts. And I think it's an interesting question as to how do we, as a community, broadcast that change when people don't even know what computer science is and explain what it is and how it fits in. And I, I don't have an answer, um, but I think it's an interesting question that I'm hearing. It's something we can continue to discuss at this conference. <coughs> So I would just end with, uh, there has been such an amazing change, and I'm really dating myself by saying I've been working on this for you know, nine or 10 years, but when I started talking to people, they had no interest in this. Well, one of the first things I tried to do was get a whole group of school administrators types to come to a meeting. No one would, co not, no one would come to my meeting, and then Google hosted it at Mountain View and everybody came. But, um, but that was very nice of Google. And, but even then, you would talk to them and they'd go, this is great, you know, this is really something we should do. And I'd say, well, are you going to? And they'd go, no. <laughs> so it was so hard to have this conversation. And now, this is all over the place, right? It's happening everywhere. People are, you know, all over the country are doing this. Whole states are doing it, districts are doing it, regions are doing it. Every time you turn around, there's some new school district or some new project in computer science. But this is a fad. Um, I, you know, I can't believe that this is going to last. And so as a community who cares about this, we have to really take advantage of what's happening right now to make it happen right and to really intentionally think about how to make it scalable and sustainable and have it go on once, the, you know, once it's not the new shiny thing, because it's not going to stay the new shiny thing for you know, forever. So we really have to take advantage of this right now and think about how to do it right and, and do it very intentionally. Okay, well thank you um, to our panelists in our room and thank you Costa for having us. In I think everybody needs a coffee. <laughs>